Okay. Sorry, everyone. Um, I got interrupted. <clears throat> uh, so this is part two of the same talk. I guess I got to build up again. Pretty much I'm wondering if our species was in denial of its own greatness or when the species found an ability to observe the problem in a way where the solution didn't create more problems. <clears throat> I don't know what it is. We are habitual creatures. We are kind of the environment's, environment's voice infused with how we perceive the environment's voice. When you look at nature, it's happening without ideology. It's like a part of nature has a subjective relationship with, it, with reality, with all phenomena. We are that subjective corner of the universe, you know. It's really fascinating. You accept things to mean something and then you walk through. The inner realms to Mr. Within appear <clears throat> as a sort of landscape upon the objective landscape. That means I can see a tree, I can imagine a tree. I could totally imagine it. Right now I'm looking at a tree with green leaves, green and yellow leaves. I could totally imagine uh, a tree with purple leaves. Do you know, I could imagine suddenly all these, all the, a tree that its leaves change color. You can totally even skip through the seasons in your inner realms you know Albert Camus has this quote where he says in the depths of winter I found within me an invincible summer in the, in what appeared to be the harshest the hardest the cruelest time there emerged a light from their inner realms <coughs> The inner realms are how you exist as a subject, not to yourself, but also to others. When I speak, it's like my inner realms are in a liquid state and they solidify. They solidify into the, in, into the, in, into the language. I can envision myself sitting in different ways while I'm sitting in a certain way right now. What does is, what is this all imply? The mind is where the potential and probabilities are created. So if a species is in denial, it is in denial of the ability of its own intelligence. That means if we can see someone do something better and they aren't doing that better thing, how does it make the person feel? You know, What if in the future, <clears throat> through advancements in nanotechnology, we managed to create a device that could endlessly 3D print very accurately and in a healthy way food. You know? Imagine if that technology was here, you know? Imagine that the species, the whole 8 billion of us on this rock in the middle of nowhere, go up Maslow's hierarchy trying to see what this ultimate self-actualization is, only to recognize that our individual efforts are a bigger picture. Believe it or not, if you zoom out of humanity, you kind of wonder, what is this picture? Imagine you were in an, we, we had jetpacks, you know, imagine a teacher uh, brings jetpacks for the kids and he's like, kids, today we're going to go um, have our classroom in the sky. <laughs> <clears throat> I am totally for making sky classrooms. Some billionaire, please do this. Build a school in the sky. <laughs> Human nature <clears throat> moves before concepts existed. That automatically makes language have an hollowness. 
Now, when language has an hollowness, what does that mean? Where is the person left? Like right now, you are an experiencer of ex existence, correct? We all are experiencing existence. As I'm speaking to you, there is this, obs there, something is looking out through my eyes that is considering itself to be um, a stable position. Do you know? It's like... That's the cool thing, because uh, the creature's eyes, many creatures, you know, <clears throat> I mean, creatures, spe different species have different ways of sight, you know, it's like a different geometry at work, but for the mammal, we see that the eyes were in front. The mammal was a creature that was designed to see the world before it saw itself, right? And so many animals, because they see the world first, they, their environment is their imagination. But human beings, they somehow manage to see themselves before the uh, world. And what does that mean? That's the Jacques, uh, as, as Jacques Lacan says, the mirror effect that happens to children. That means there's some super young infants that you put them in front of the mirror, the infant can't tell the reflection is a reflection of itself. You know, the infant goes and touches the mirror. It's the same with certain uh, puppies, kittens, you know. They, when they look at the mirror, they can't tell if it's something else or if it's them. Why? Because the creature has not had a moment where it has looked at itself. And that's all that meditation was. Self-inquiry, self-realization. You know what that means? That means there is something happening before you and you are now emergent in the system and now you got to realize what was happening before you and how you are a movement of it. I am tired of, of this game of nations, and it's not just me, many philosophers have. And, it, and when I say the game of nations, I don't mean I am tired of nationalism. Nationalism was important for individualism. That means it was like, again, we, the world people were speaking different dialects, and it was only through a sort of making firmer decisions of identity, national identity, that suddenly it became one language. So people were, believe it or not, talking in their own worlds and when one language was established we could suddenly communicate about the same realm. Diogenes, once somebody came up to this person, this philosopher, Greek philosopher, and Diogenes is known as the father of cynicism, and he was pretty much a very conscious guy back in the day, but he was a bit of a maverick, so he would do very unconventional, like, unconventional things. <clears throat> Anyways, <clears throat> one day somebody comes and asks the great Diogenes, and says, Diogenes, where are you from, man? Where are you from? Where are you a citizen of? And Diogenes stares at the guy, like this long stare. And Diogenes says, where am I from? I'm a citizen of the cosmopolites. You see, that's the greatness beyond nationalism, where we identify as a universal presence, not just coloring the face of this earth and thinking that we are something you know something specific you know human beings are expressions of nature we are trees that walk <laughs>
and talk. <laughs> That'd be really freaky if all if like you you know imagine somebody's climbing a tree and the tree's like, hey, yo, climb on that branch, it's safer. You're like, yo, is the tree doing <laughs> You're like, yo, this is a helpful tree. <laughs> it's so quiet today in the chat section. That's good. You know, people are meditating probably. <laughs> <clears throat> we have to ask the question. Really, people, they are not waiting, uh, any person waiting. Uh, for something to happen, you will see there is so many unknown variables in life that you are just this humble known entity. Whatever you do, you just know a certain range, you know. And uh, I remember I heard this years ago. It was this kind of wisdom where they said the person who can laugh at themselves can laugh because they are seeing something more than themselves. You see, when you realize you're not a creature of thought, the greatness of humanity becomes. The, how, the quality of the experience that 8 billion tourists in conscious manifestation are having. You know, for, on some level, yes, like I, I have visions of an advanced civilization, but on another level, I also see that it's, it's a, it's, there's a micro angle to it and there's a macro angle. In the macro, we need to change the overall system. And we need to find, as, as Jordan Peterson, various others have said, that we need to uh, go towards a new ethos. And ethos means the inspiration of a people. You know, that means when Jordan Peterson was debating Sam Harris, which I consider that to be one of, uh, uh, one of the most important debates, long waited for debates in history. And so in that debate, um, Jordan Peterson was in some sense saying that Sam Harris was saying that religious fundamentalism leads to extreme actions, extreme behavior, and where is that dividing line? Right, and Jordan Peterson was bringing an emphasis to how, for example, religion for most people it is a narrative. It is a narrative that gives value to their life. Like I, I, I can give you an example. For example, I personally, I'm not like religious like that, you know. <laughs> but my grandmother, grandfather, do you know they are religious? And as they have been getting older and older, the way they've been managed to accept their life is that it's it was never in their hands but it's in the hands of their highest hope do you see what i mean so it's like a narrative it's like human beings just like we need clothing to shelter our skin from the storm we shelter our minds from the void through narrative through stories through meaning through games you know so many people don't realize it but one of the most important thing to do in humanity is not just constantly reach higher levels, higher levels, it's, it's, it's creating new games in reality. What does that mean? New events, new things to people to run into the street, uh, streets to do. And of course, nature does this automatically. Right now, I'm speaking in 2020, and it's a good moment in history. It's like the Black Plague of modern times, the coronavirus uh, years, you know. And I see that it's like, uh, and especially it's kind of intersecting currently as I'm giving this talk with um, a lot of kind of social tension of certain events that have happened in regards to George Floyd and whatnot, you know. And so what is this? It's like nature is moving the chess pieces, Ma nature is making some chess moves, and man is making some chess moves. And when we realize, believe it or not, every person... If you have memory, you're going to notice you have access to your ch uh, younger eyes. Do you see the hilarity with age? You know, there was, um, there was something, I mean, of course, right now, it's, uh, it's the, still the era of language worship. That means people's freedom and liberation is through honoring the language that identifies them. We are at a language-sensitive time in, on the civilization, and it's a good thing. I am so happy that it, it, it's like certain events are taking place. Why? Because it brings new games. And for how long can you walk in the shoes of the past? You'll see those shoes have been ripped for modern times. So the ethos, the new ethos is a new narrative. <clears throat> 
and it's a new relationship of the human being with how the storification of the world is being their identity. And Mr. Within is saying, that moment when you open your eyes in the morning, are you someone? Are you something? Do you have philosophies? Do you believe in God? Do you not believe in God? In that moment where you just wake up? No. That moment you just wake up in the mor morning, it's experiential. And as experience grounds itself in the conscious waking state, it then evokes subjective realms. So I'm telling everybody, like, when I sleep, when I go to sleep, uh, right before I go to sleep, I literally see every thought throughout the day that had emerged in my life. If you're conscious, you'll notice this. It's as if it completes its destiny in the inner realms. What does that mean? That means, for example... <clears throat> Alright, let's say... <laughs> I don't know, let's say you get in an argument with someone in the day. Let's say, I don't know, you're riding a bike and you fall. Then what I'm saying is when you go to sleep that night, you're going to think about the events of the day. And that's the thing about the mind. It's constantly, it's like this, the mind is like a child with a flashlight. You know, and the child is pointing that flashlight everywhere. It's like, it's like you know what I mean? <laughs> It's like a laser beam hit going into a hall of mirrors, like, chit, 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 like it, it hits everything, you know. <laughs> I learned to honor my mind, and that's honestly the unique, most unique thing that changed. In my youth, I didn't care. It was okay to just be this bewildered uh, movement to worry uh, in time. But then something changed. Because I noticed my own mortality, that was the biggest wake-up call. When you realize you're like a candle melting in every moment, but at the same time giving off the light of a conscious being, so you realize that this light must be used, you know? And it's up to you to see the world. Do you know you have to put in effort to actually see the real world? that no child on this planet is ever seeing the world as it is, they are seeing the world as they are. People never see people as, as, they, uh, as who they really are, you know? There's been times, I, I, I remember I noticed this early on in my life, where any per, the person would come and say, you know, negative cons, comments or something, and I would just stare. I would stare, and I would, in my mind, I was laughing. Let me tell you why. Because if you don't engage, if you don't throw firewood into the fire, the fire goes out. If a person gets angry and you act like they don't exist, <laughs> their anger, their anger is meaningless. <laughs> because most people express to kind of engage in a social game. It's it's like. Believe it or not, you can say, you, we can even bring Steve Nash into this and uh, suggest that it's like a psychological game theory with the known and unknown variables that the creature perceives in the moment. You see, I find the scholarly path is about illumination. And illumination means that the light in the room is getting brighter and brighter as you live. <clears throat> Now the question comes, imagine we're eight, I mean not, not imagine, I mean this is the case, we're eight billion human beings on this rock. Now imagine eight, out of these eight billion people, imagine two scenarios. One scenario where eight billion people feel great, one person doesn't, one member of the civilization doesn't feel great. And now imagine a scenario where one member of a civilization feels great and the rest of the civilization doesn't feel great. So we would see that in both cases, we don't have an advanced civilization. And this may be an extreme suggestion, you know? People are going to be like, Mr. Within, how could we have 8 billion great people? And if one person isn't great, you're saying we don't have an advanced civilization, even though those 8 billion people build so much, you know? And Mr. Within is saying yes, because if we are starting to notice that humanity transcends color and creed. 
We are realizing that the mind is not a shape, but it moves through shapes. That means look at yourself as an example. Do you look at how many moments in your life you were just a simple human being? You know? Life is, sometimes it appears as if the question is complex, the answer is simple. Sometimes it appears as the answer is, uh, the, the question is simple, the answer is complex. <clears throat> and believe it or not, these are just elevations for how the attention pilots between the four dimensions, the four, uh, Mr. With, this is through Mr. Within's school of thought, of course, you're listening to my talk here, so I'm, I'm sharing how I perceive the dimensions. And I've simplified it in a, in, a, in a model, actually, with a totally different way we see dimensions. I am seeing the dimensions of existence as seasons. I am seeing uh, the multidimensionality of this world seasonal. And I think I might be like the early bird on this planet, kind of seeing it that way. Let me tell you why. And to be honest, I got the inspiration for my science fiction. I remember I wrote in just one, I was writing the science fiction uh, scene. And in the scene, I said the fourth dimensional, the, 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 the fourth dimension of spring, like something like that I had said, the fourth dimensional season of spring. You know, that means even the season had a season, had a cycle of seasons it went through. So welcome to the chat, everybody. You can only judge a human being if you feel you know. And the feeling of knowing in a world with so many dimensions is really should be unknown. That means we are a spark of knowledge in a vast unknown darkness. And we are processing what is most immediate around us and in our environment. Mr. Within is asking for the species to usher itself into a new acknowledgement of reality, imagination, language. Do you know, it, it is not just me saying this, dear listeners. You know, Terence McKenna said a culture evolves as fast as its language does. Do you know, Ludwig Wittgenstein said the limits of my world, the limits of my language are the limits of my world. Hafez Shirazi said, uh, <coughs> the words you speak become the house you live in. Shri Ramana Marshi said, silence is also conversation. You know, think about the presence of knowing not being limited. That means if we follow up with Rene Descartes' mind-body dualism, if there is 0, 0.0, whatever amount of zeros you want, 1% chance that there, the mind is multidimensional, then it is our ignorance to see a shape in a world where it's like it's a changing film. You know, it's like beliefs are snapshots. It's like anybody can have a belief. I could in any second believe anything, you know, and I can disbelieve anything. You can, I, I could even be, uh, disbelieve something I believe. I can even believe in my disbelief, do you know? But it doesn't help you because it is a photographic relationship with actually what life is, a film. The Whiteheadian process, the Fullerian, <laughs> Buckminster Fuller's uh, God verb, that God is not... Uh, a shape. It is the cosmic process of work, regardless of how you identify. Some human beings in the 6th century, they looked at the sky and they're like, wait a minute, I got a personality. Could the sky have a personality? <laughs> and so the emergence of the quality that this world is animate, just like how you see the cells in your blood, 
blood veins. Imagine one day the cells in your blood veins, suddenly they became conscious, they developed a language, science, technology, but they were still cells in your blood veins. You see what I mean? Imagine those cells built a language, built mathematics to try to comprehend why the human being goes to work. They can't even perceive the human being. So it is our existential position that limits what we can see to believe. But because we know the existential position is limited, we know sight is limited. And all those people who want to see it to believe it don't realize what we call sight is a frequency. It's a certain range of perception. Animals see a different frequency. Snakes see an infrared. That's higher than human beings in frequency. Other animals see in lesser. For example, they say dogs see in black and white. That means who knew, you know? Uh, dogs are like, are in a film noir movie the whole time. <laughs>
uh, the tree to catch you when you climb it. You can't expect civilization to uh, make to look care for your blind spots. You know, somebody once told me, and it was savage. I did I disagreed with them, but years later I saw how he could how they could how I could agree with them. They said that society is a machine, and it's a machine that it ha is being inputted so many different uh, patterns. That it's like when the person goes into the machine, it's like you're being pushed into the subconscious of a higher mind. You know, quantum, uh, let me say it like this, <clears throat> theoretical physicists, they wonder about what is inside a black hole. And you see, nobody can see what's inside a black hole because its gravitational pull is too intense. Literally, it's like instant uh, evapor. It's like evaporation. You're evaporating because of the gravitational pull. You're evaporating to yourself, like literally... Well, uh, I don't know. Who knows what happens? Who knows if the black hole is a portal or not, you know? But I'm telling you, theoretical physicists, they wonder about this, and they wonder if there's universes inside a black hole. Do you know? And it's like an exit to another universe. It's like a curtain uh, blocking the doorway, you know? <clears throat> so the theoretical physicist has no problem theorizing, visualizing abstract potentials of what reality could be. But when another person, for example, from the 6th century, they entertain, they try to also see how their idea was real, you know, then they are banished. So you see, let me tell you something scary. Ideology is woo-woo. All of it. Because nobody sees the thought in the same way. No two people on this earth see one thought in the same exact way. You know, you can't see points of common commonality, but you can't see the whole thing. That means uh, people are not clones. It would be scary. Uh, so guys, the question has come in the chat section. Honk says, Honk if you don't exist says, so Mr. Within, is the higher mind inside or outside? Here's the cool thing. Uh, I'll tell you this, Honk. When you go within, I, I'm, I'm like the guy saying Mr. Within. Like I thought that was like a, that name needed to exist in history. <laughs> so when you go within, to the within, there is no without. The same way... We are right now saying that light is hitting an object, entering our eyes, being processed into the world we see. The same way the world, in, in the way it processes itself, it defines the sight. So it's a situation, it's a good question you're asking, because it's literally the, one of those ultimate mystical questions, where it's like the same moment where the actor and the spotlight are wondering if they're one and the same, or they are different. It's like you wondering, is my mind moving my body right now? Is, is an unknown mind moving a known a body, do you know? Or in some sense, is a known body moving an unknown mind? If you are more materialistically oriented, you, you, you march with the banner of materialism uh, behind you, then, then in some sense, uh, you feel you will... Un uh, let me tell you, the materialistic pr perspective is so nihilistic, it's strange. It's strange that it, it reduces all questions. That means materialism is the death of the question. <clears throat> death of a question beyond materialism. It's kind of like when Friedrich Nietzsche said, God is dead and man killed him. Man killed the potential of 
an individual relationship with a collective being. Self, no, but not realizing in the future, the AI and through virtual reality, we're going to act like gods. It's like we, it's like we, we had to disbelieve in gods to become gods ourselves. You know? <laughs> Highly poetic. So I would say there is no higher mind. The higher mind is how the unknown moves knowledge. And when you become content with that, uh, somebody in the chat section said, uh, for example, Mr. GF says, Mr. Great says, yeah, I was thinking this the other day, law needs to be rooted in a virtue, for mine is the Tao. For example, we have someone in the chat section who the Tao, Tao is, where, is, is, is the soil where the roots of their existence are planted in. For me, personally, there was a phase of my life where it was very important to just not resist anything, to just hover it as oneness <laughs> in emptiness, you know? There was a phase. But after that, you come to a full circle, as they say in Zen, where the person who escaped, like there was something in front of you. Imagine there's like a sandwich in front of you, and instead, and you, there's that, let's say you're hungry, but then you, somebody tells you the sandwich is an illusion. You shouldn't eat the sandwich, you know? And so you're living in this material existence. I mean, like, just entertain the ancient mind. The ancient mind, this was the way. They saw life as a dream. They saw the outer realm as a dream uh, of the inner awakening. That means the real you is not a you. And it was mind-blowing at that point because it was just the presence of reality. That means, I'm telling you, before, before, uh, uh, I mean, I think this is the way it happens naturally. You observe as the void and through a singular dimension, or if you have lived properly through an infinite dimension, the death of duality. The death of duality is not, it's the death of duality, but the birth as a simpler form of the system. Guys, I'm not saying that materialism is, is naive. I'm just saying that everything is an approach and the approach is hovering in the middle of nowhere. So the fact that intelligence is happening right now, and it's like there was this person, I forget it, his name, but he was a social scientist. Oh, sorry, not social scientist. It, it, it was this woman who was a scientist, who she was saying, and when asked about consciousness, that why is it, for example, certain decisions, it is left to our consciousness, but certain decisions are not. For example, you don't have to constantly think about your heart to beat for it to beat. It just naturally beats. A lot of nature just just happens. Do you know? But the uh, but that scientist was saying she was saying that. Oh, how is it? How is it that certain things are are in conscious control? Why is it that I have free will in these contexts and not in those contexts? Do you see? And that's the unique thing. I feel that the free will is wherever the attention is. Okay, guys, so Honk says something interesting. He says, we just happen to be in the middle of the, of the moment-to-moment -moment pr procession of infinity. <sighs> yes, but that is, that's what I'm telling you. That's still not full circle. The full circle was this example. I never finished saying it. It was like, imagine there's a sandwich in front of you, and people say the sandwich doesn't exist, so you don't eat the sandwich. Then you go through this whole journey, this, let's say, poetic soul journey, this the soul quest <laughs> it's like soul quest unlocked <laughs>
you go on this kind of solar journey, S-O-U-L-A-R, and as you go on the solar journey, you suddenly realize the first thing you were running away from was divine. You realize because you were afraid, you didn't look at it completely. And the whole thing about this whole liberation movement in mystical uh, traditions around the world We are the birds of paradise that must build their nests on earth. Nested in, nested in earth, the birds of paradise fly beyond the clouds of abstraction. You know, Mr. Within wants to see um, a renaissance of human beings wondering how fascinating life is and how much the species still doesn't know that's the only thing i'm telling you guys i've had many many challenges throughout the years that i've been giving these talks and it's fun it's kind of funny it's like when i wake up i'm like all right nature let's see what chess moves you're gonna make today you know The wind between the branches, it's there, but you can't see it. And you can only believe it in how you see the leaves move. That means certain things, their evidence is, is limited to their result. And you know, this is a question, an uh, incredible question. I remember in one of my poetic mystical writings, I had said this poetic line that you are in a private lesson with God. And what I thought about that was that because I, it was kind of a response to my own past where I noticed that the way the world is, because we, we, we notice space, we advance. This has been the general strategy in reality. You, you have to become, you have to expand the space of a possibility before actualizing it. So I'll give you an example. When I, this is something that maybe it's a mindset that could be useful to some people. Guys, when there is a problem, I don't think, I don't care for the answer. Let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. Because if I care for the answer, I want to see one step ahead and I'll never see it. So how I challenge problems is I look at the problem and I see an as above, uh, so below kind of situation to the problem. What does that mean? That means I think about if I had, uh, what would, it's like thinking about the solution of the problem rather than one step ahead, like hundred steps ahead, attempting as far as possible to wonder about uh, what would you, uh, in how many ways, uh, how many, uh, I don't know how to say it, it's like never attempt one step ahead attempt like 10 steps ahead and then three steps ahead will come easily to you that's what i'm saying that's the that's the algorithm uh the stoic algorithm that mr within uh, entertains it's really important guys i'm telling you because it's all about the story you tell do you know what strength is strength is which story you have decided to be a character in and that was the whole thing about honor as well, that honor was the preservation of a value that deserved to be. When we honor the civilization, we will see its greatness. That's the uh, path, guys. You have to honor something, then you see how it can be great. You know, if you don't honor it, then you don't even care to see how it moves. You know, you cannot have physics without anti-physics, which is metaphysics. Like you have matter and you have anti-matter. And it's kind of even poetic because you see there is a self and you wonder about the anti-self. 
and so I would say the same distinguish I, I think Paul Dirac mentioned something in these lines I'm not sure but I think in Paul Dirac was a person who came up with uh, equations for antimatter and he was also someone who said something very incredible to all scientists and he said uh, to the world of scientists he said if there is to be an equation that is going to explain all of reality a formula that equation needs to be beautiful and for example you ask a scientist what is the most beautiful uh, equation and they will tell you E equals MC squared how energy is a dance between mass and the speed of light in our eyes. Guys, there, before thought there is something else. Notice that the, uh, the thoughts are, uh, um, they are the effect they are not the origin. You you are aware of thought. That means this might be a bit intense for our species to acknowledge, but behind your eyes, you're not being a self. You're being the world moving the self. That means it's like somehow the human being, it, uh, it's like this relationship where we're living an outer life and we're living an inner life and the outer life uh, updates the inner life, updates the potential of the inner life, you know? You know, there's this quote from Chris Rock, the comedian. He says, women need food, water, and compliments. That's right. And an occasional pair of shoes. <laughs> there's another one. It's pretty much this... Um, just this idea that we need to water the value in our lives. That's it, really. Your attention is watering how, how far things exist in your moment. And it's very hard to think of love without a sacrifice of the inner realm to be nothing in order for something else to be something, you know. It's kind of like the, uh, lover, the lover's psychology as the poet Rumi gives an incredible imagery for. He says lovers are like a moth and a candle flame. And so in his poetry, he gives this image where he's, there's this moth that's flying in, is at night around this candle. <clears throat> in the darkness of existence, this moth is flying around this candle for many nights, for eons. And then suddenly, the flame burns. The flame burns the wing of the moth. The moth gets too close to the candle, its wing hits the flame. And in that instant, it's as if you know, both the flame is going out, you know, and at the same time, like the wing of the bird, you know, the wing of the bird, uh, what am I saying, wing of the bird, the wing of the moth is also, the moth is, is it's like both of them are falling, you know, <clears throat> and the moth shouts at its lover, the candle flame, and says, how could you burn me? All these nights, I flew around you, keeping you company in the loneliness of this cosmos how could you burn me and then the poet the poem is so intense guys that the candle flame speak begins to speak void reaching romance you know of reality that we're just on some level creatures just doing stuff when you look at it in a simple way you realize such an ignorance to have even fathomed an enemy because it's so fragile Life is so fragile, it's ridiculous. And sometimes I'm like, how, the, how are we still here? <laughs>
And even though our bodies, our biological body is fragile and needs to be cared for, but the mind of man, oh, the mind of man is a lion. As Milarepa says, you only throw a stick at a lion once. <laughs> As if this dude threw a stick at a lion and the lion just stared at him. He's like, holy shit, if there ever was a time I wanted to become a marathon runner, now would be... <laughs> We might be descendants of an unknown descendant and a chimpanzee. Uh, <clears throat> our descent, sorry, our descendants might be. Or no, anyways. <laughs> but I feel the mind can rule, and that's the purpose of the life. It is not for you to just sit in a comfortable chair. Trust me, non-existence is the most comfortable chair to sit in and you will sit uh, on, uh, on that chair your whole life. The purpose of humanity is from whatever chair of ethnocentrism you're on, you get up and you get up from an inner will. That means it's not somebody who's going to say something profound, it's how your mind is going to look at itself that's going to be the, the roar of that line. You know, and so right now the civilization, because it's it's not up to date, and we can't really blame it. I mean, it it seems to be, at least to to me, uh, a, a very recognizable pattern that no political system is as up to date as its most updated uh, citizen. What does that mean? That means there's blind spots to any governing system. So how do we conduct, uh, how do we create an efficient system? It's all about the input, the information people get. People get. That means even you see all those hardworking, you know, firemen, police, um, nurses, especially at this time, do you see? It's, it's like they are limited to uh, contact. That means the problem needs to contact them. Right now we're living in a civilization that will care for you, that will back you up if you contact and if you communicate to it. But in the future there will be a civilization so mighty that it will care, it will run towards its humanity and lift, lift, uh, break poverty's spell. Sorry guys, just got a bit emotional, uh, and it's too much of a sunny day to get emotional. <laughs> Who is it that is aware of the who? In the Upanishads, they say the seer of the scene is unseen. That means the one aware that they are aware is attributeless. The secret of eons revealed before, because it was literally when the ice broke, that was what was left. The ring of the absent heaven, which I was saying how I see the, this sort of spiraling dimensions of this world, and it's spiraling and it's kind of seasonal in the sense that it goes from the zero dimension to the one dimension to the two dimension towards the infinite dimension. The zero dimension means you find uh, it's pretty much such it under to some degree indirectly. <laughs> but what it is is just you honor space. You and honor means you see something for what it is, really. 
That's the highest honor. Honor is not behavioral even. It's it's how much the heart notices other hearts really. It's really information games. After the information revolution, we became creatures that no longer hungered for food. That means you could see the most violent person in existence, you know, most extreme, but then you can see a single idea can change them. That's the fascinating thing, that when human beings are collectively conscious, the whole cosmos watches the grand performance take place. You know, I feel that it's not that we're alone, even though Fermi's paradox suggests, like, where are all the aliens? <laughs> where are they? You know? <laughs> and imagine the aliens were like humanity, you smell of ignorance, we can't come near you. <laughs> Once you confront space, once you realize it's okay for there to be space, does space have a meaning? Are people fighting over the definition of empty space? No. Nobody care. Have you noticed we all care about how the universe is filled and full and how the cosmos works, but nobody cares about emptiness because what is there to care about? And that's space. That's the simple acknowledgement that you are. your attention is also aware of non-phenomena. <laughs> You have to have spaces between the lines to be able to read the sentence. You need to have space between the words to be able to read the sentence. Once you are content with space, you're comfortable with space, then you're the next thing, into the next uh, dimension to uh, the pilot must, the next elevation the pilot must become familiar with is the singularity of phenomena. That means look at your individual body, look at how you can perceive yourself as an individual and acknowledge that it's your universal birthright to be who you are. So once that's the kind of singularity of things, notice how objects are individual on their own, you know? And notice how the whole planet is an object. You know, you can see this. Noticing the individualness of phenomena. Then you go where? <laughs> once you have uh, the void has become aware of the singular, it reaches the first duality. The first duality is how one plus one is two. That means the singular became conscious of the void and it became a subjective self to itself. When it became a subjective self, that was the emergence of duality. Now the mind of the creature could compare. Now the mind of the creature could, in some sense, relate to things. There was good, there was bad, and, I, and I'm telling you, duality was simply awareness to how the earth was getting a tan. This constant light, no light, light, no light. Light, no light. When there was light, oh, reality, thanks. When there's no light, oh, gosh, where'd it go? <laughs> it's an oscillation. 
dualism is a process. Duality is a process. Language is alive. <laughs> Especially when you are. <laughs> Language can be alive. <laughs> So once you're comfortable with any duality, what does that mean? That means suddenly your mind going into this speed processing mode where if it, it, through an advanced challenge of visualization, it is instantly seeing all the ways it can be. It's like I, sometimes before I, like in the moment, I feel honestly when I, just my whole life, not my whole life, after a certain point, I feel like the presence of an attention prior to language. And that feels like a, a sort of, d d like a coin with two sides, where there are signals emerging from within, being processed externally, and there are signals from external reality, from in front of your eyes, uh, in which they are being internally processed. And this relationship with the inner realms and the outer realms, uh, that is the most crucial thing. That is the end of the language wars. The language threshold. <sighs> Sorry, guys, I'm just stretching. Oh my god! Nature. You know, I thought about it, I thought about it, I thought it's kind of like hilarious. You know how human beings, they go to the park and they, for example, I don't know, like you see people throw seeds for pigeons. <laughs> so when you throw seeds for pigeons, you know, <laughs> it's like that's a lesser life form. Not even being able to understand who the human being is, but just sees the food thrown. And I had this view, what if from higher dimensions we are being fed uh, imagery and so we still can't uh, comprehend how complex like a pigeon can't understand why a politician sa says what they say <laughs> and of course most people don't understand why politicians say what they say <laughs> Guys, a good metaphor, you know, somebody said it, I had said it, um, okay, I had kind of seen, like, imagine yourself looking from outside of a house. Imagine yourself looking from outside of the house. The owner of the house is like, hey man, look at my house, you know, one house. Look at one house. Look at this one thing when you're outside of the house. But when you go inside the house, you suddenly see how many different rooms there are. And when you go in within your inner realms, when you become sensitive to it through stillness and silence, that means, believe it or not, just for 10 to 20 minutes, just be still and silent and have no, no future. Literally, there's nothing to do. You're just watching the moment like a film. You will be fascinated after 10 and 20 minutes of just watching the moment what happens? You will suddenly find how the mind is moving. The, the less the body moves, um, the less physical movement, the more awareness to, uh, uh, if you're secular, let's say, what the physical is generating in a subway, in a subtler way. Uh, and if you're non-secular, it's uh, what it is, really. Sometimes I wondered, what is the job of the mind? That means we look at the organs of the body, you know, and let's say we look at the brain and we're like, what is its job? And then we're asking, 
what the brain produces, this projection of individualism, this projection of personhood, now we're wondering what is the job of that, the mind's ability, the brain, what the brain is leading to. What is the job of what the brain is, has led to? You know, this mind sphere way. You see, it's as if all the organs in your body, they are given different tasks, yet they are part of one system. <coughs> so it is fair to say that the mind is an organ in a higher dimensional body potentially i'm saying like we can see the echo of patterns fractals what is the most valuable thing let's say that 8 billion human beings can do what is the most valuable thing like let's ask that question because really, greatness is what the probability we envision and how far we go with it, okay? And I feel that if we are realizing ourselves to be, to be a witness of thought and not a, a thought, we're going to find ourselves being like the wind between every branch of knowledge. <clears throat> that means just like how the wind and this sort of invis invisible force... <laughs> blows the, uh, moves the leaves, similarly human beings looking at the different uh, branches of knowledge, whatever way they've been categorized, it's as if the, the person, the professor in the university, they have become a professor not just because they've learned what the past is saying, they have also shared new, new discoveries or something. They have advanced the branch of knowledge they have they have they have added more branches you know <clears throat> but the thing is it's it's like a invisible uh push that leads to a visibility that later on can be engaged really the mind is not an object the mind is aware of how it's being an object and so the discrimination between the awareness and the self, because we all, every person in the world, you're, you're, you're like, what is life? Don't be like, all right, man, you're a self and you're aware of things and you go throughout this life and it changes the self and it changes your awareness. Like, that's life. <laughs> but the thing is, this relationship of a self with awareness, right now, the self is uh, the alphabet that we're using to communicate in society. I feel the society has to care for a language that is unified in potential outcome. What does that mean? That means if, if civilization was a company, all the leaders of that company get in a room and they're like, all right, where are we going with this company? You know, they ask that question. And how far are we going with this company? And they ask that question. And if they have an ambition, you know, uh, for me, a great business is a business that has thought about more than 100 years of its progression on this earth. They've thought about creating a wave of an influence on this planet that is, uh, it's, it's going to, how can I tell you? It's like, how does it feel when you see, imagine back in the day, uh, you see your kingdom is under siege and your kingdom is victorious and it, it, it like you, it's like uh, the, your kingdom wasn't destroyed that day. You saved your kingdom. You see, just think about the medieval mindset of people living inside a castle, you know, living in, inside uh, uh, this kingdom, and suddenly a part of that kingdom being under siege, and all the, all the people being like, holy shit, we got to do something. <laughs> and so there's that moment where everybody knows if the kingdom is breached through everybody suffers so before the walls of the kingdom are breached all human value is dedicated to that wall and so we have to not only develop the blueprints of a, a prototype 
uh, as a global, uh, as a, uh, for now it's appearing in a digital mode, so as a digital global community, we must start this renaissance of wondering how do we build an advanced civilization? How do we build an advanced civilization? You know, if you're a student of any a uh, university, go ask your professor how, how in some sense, uh, through the lens, through the eyes the professor has, how we can build an advanced civilization. Because an advanced civilization doesn't cry for yesterday. It's being guided by the celebrations of the future, that there will be in the future. You know? it's, it's a sort of mentality. You know, it's it's like there was something in Maximus in the movie Gladiator that he before he would fight, he would just get the dirt, put it on his hands, and just get a feeling as if, like, in that moment was so profound for me because I'm like, this dude knows that he can potentially die, so he's touching the dirt, and he's feeling the dirt he will return to if he fails. So once you accept, once you... Uh, uh, wash your hands like Maximus with the dirt of your world and then you suddenly see whatever happens happens it's nature it's the beautiful thing nature is is this endless urge to perform as a form only to realize that pre form pre the form there was an there was a movement so it, it's kind of like the, the, what separates the inner life and the outer life, the inner realms and the outer realms, and how the outer realms are what's in front of your eyes and the inner realms is what's behind, is that what's behind is like a subject with direction and speed. What's in front of your eyes is an object that can be directed in accordance to how the subjectivity is real. Because I was thinking, if in the future AI opens its eyes, let's say the super intelligent computer is like, all right, let me see who created me. <laughs> and the AI comes and sees po poetically, I'm saying this, of course, I can't fathom how the processing would be of the AI. But <clears throat> I'm, I'm just saying playfully, it'd be like, the AI is going to be like, these human beings are not that different from me, you know? We, it's like the AI has code, and for human beings, language is your code. And even on a biolo biological level, your cells, uh, the, the DNA is the code, right? So the AI is going to be like, all right, I, it's totally believable for the AI how we are its parents, you know? Because we're in a certain space, in a certain condition, and we are uh, responding to it. And that response is in accordance to a sort of code. So it's like the first mysticism was the was a was a program trying to become aware of the programmer, uh, and in the efforts to do so, realized the programmer was there from the beginning. The programmer has not stopped writing the code. This poetically cosmic programmer. <laughs> Can you imagine if we we clear we confirmed we confirmed that this world was a simulation imagine what pa how parents would go and talk to their children
value is where the attention is. <clears throat> and where the attention is, is really how the attention is being. And honestly, I don't know. I don't know what else science, the scientific um, imagination, <clears throat> the scientific vision, uh, how far it can go if it doesn't consider uh, higher dimensions, guys. Like, that's, that's a very crucial point. Because if you nullify everything to the visible, that means it's like you're, you're not even believing in Wi-Fi waves, you know? Imagine you go somewhere and there's the person says there's no Wi-Fi here, man, and you're like, yeah, there is. And the person's like, I gotta see it to believe it. And you're like, I can't show you where the Wi-Fi wi router is. Do you know? It's like imagine it's it's like somewhere else, you know. And the person's like, no, man. Then there's no Wi-Fi waves. And then the person's like, just take your phone and check out for yourself. And the person's like, I gotta see it to believe it. I don't even need to check my phone to see if there's a Wi-Fi signal here. You know, and the person's like, dude, just check it in my phone. It says there's a Wi-Fi signal here. You know, like you have Wi-Fi. And the person inevitably oh, to, has no choice but to turn on the phone and check it. And they see there was always Wi-Fi. <clears throat> this doesn't mean we should suddenly give this to a divine agency or an abstract story. You know, I'm not saying we got to be ancient Greek about this, but I'm saying like, Sometimes the question doesn't exist. It's just an introduction to the unknown. A species that cares for the unknown <clears throat> will care for its knowledge. A species that doesn't care for the unknown will lock itself in language as the eons pass. I feel that uh, when you realize that it's okay to be present, it's okay to exist in this world, and the, the, just, the, just the navigation through it after the dualistic dimension, you reach the final uh, port, point of the ring of the absent heaven, and then it repeats, and then you get to the infinite dimension. I say singularity is the mother of duality, <coughs> Duality is the father of infinity. Therefore, when we can observe the dual, we reach the edge of conception. Because conception is dualistic. Language is a dualistic technology. You have to be an individual to be able to speak. You know? <clears throat> They're like, why doesn't that good, why doesn't that person, uh, you know, uh, answer when we ask him a deep question? And the person's like, you know, somebody who knew the person was like, he's answering you. It's just that your question doesn't have an auditory answer. It's experiential. It's 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 where all the senses are being gravitated towards in the in, in, in as an instantaneous moment conscious of itself. The word Satchit uh, Ananda
So in the chat section, <coughs> Honk says space time uh, or space time are limited by the speed of light. Consciousness maybe transcends all space time. So that's the thing. You know, this was something that Terence McKenna, the scholar, I, I heard him speak of it as well, where he was saying it's like the in in uh, Einstein's Albert Einstein's space time. Um, he's pretty much saying the faster you move, uh, uh, as the speed of light, the slower time becomes. You know, so when we are moving at the speed of light, could that be a state where there is no time? Okay. So, what does that mean? Terence McKenna was saying, could that mean that that moment where we feel there is no time, we're moving at the speed of light? We're aware at the speed of light? <laughs> it's like, is, is, my, is my consciousness, uh, you know, driving at the speed of light? <laughs> Seeing reality at the speed of light? It's like, guys, uh, it's like, you know, it's like the ultimate brag. You know, the person's like, I'm so, I'm so, uh, <laughs> the person, ego person's like, I'm so incredible. You don't know me. I catch light with my eyes. <laughs> that's, that's how badass of a species we are. We are, uh, our sight is how our eyes are catching light. The sun's like throwing light like a baseball and our eyes are like, got it, you know? And we're like throwing it back as our expression. You know? <clears throat> this thing about uh, 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 Satchit Ananda, Sat, Chit means consciousness, Ananda means bliss, and Sat means existence, if I, if I remember correctly. So Satchit Ananda means... <clears throat> uh, being the moment you're conscious that consciousness and existence are simultaneously present, that is bliss. You free, your inner realms pretty much free. I think like you can discriminate your you can observe your um, you liberate as the freedom uh, that only you can give your own eyes. Something like that. So Mr. Great says in the chat section, the whole fabric of reality is consciousness, instant feedback on all layers. Excuse me. Yeah, guys, I don't know. I just feel that um, the species has an option. And the answer to the question, why, question mark, is why not. So I'm saying, like, if the species can be advanced, if we're on a rock in the middle of nowhere, regardless of how we interpret it, the only thing we can realistically do is build something on this planet. So I feel the educational system should inspire people not towards becoming uh, soldiers of an economical system to go survive in an economical battle. For them to uh, obtain an innovative ability that we as a species, just like there was a point where there was discrimination and important people came and uh, uh, gave speeches that opened the eyes of humanity, that uh, we are just at, on some level, what is it, energy conscious of itself. It's like, what are you going to do? Yeah. <laughs> it's like there is... There is a strange, it's like once we access our humanity, then, then you can see how advanced the human being could be. That means you are no longer seeing an individual human being and just valuing them on who you think they are. <laughs> 
Their value has a va- they have a collective value. That means I'm saying this to whoever you who hears this. Uh, if there's violence in, in, in the streets, you don't know. It's like imagine there was a conference of all the greatest scientists in the world, but it was in a bad neighborhood in in like in this really bad neighborhood and dangerous neighborhood and suddenly like we had thugs kind of fighting science you know <laughs> so it would be a situation where it's like you never know the potential and what sort of contribution the human being that you see walking in the street can have for the civilization when we hold people with a collective value you care for them with the same way you care for how mighty your advanced civilization will be because any person born whether you like it or not you're pioneers to a thousand years ahead that's it everybody is a pioneer aren't they when you think about the future I'm like oh my god you know, <clears throat> me find it's like <laughs> it's like everything's being pioneered for the future generations but now. And I feel, believe it or not, the strategy on some level socially, yeah, you have to be like Eckhart Tolle and be like, everybody come to the here now, right now. <laughs> <clears throat> or or the strategy will be that we just think about the future. We think about not what is beautiful now being destroyed, but the beauty that the future can have. There's, there's something about beauty that, I don't know, I, I was blessed to have a grandmother, and it was uh, strange where she, she would, I remember me and my brother were young, very young, like maybe like seven, six years old or something, you know, and... I have, a, I have a twin brother, by the way, and so I remember my grandmother would, uh, we would be at my grandmother's place, and she would cook food, and she would call us over, very excited, very happy, you know, and she would tell us that, look at this food, eat this food, it's beautiful. That's, that's what she would say. She wouldn't say it's, it, it has, what kind of taste it has, she would say, eat this food, it's beautiful, right? And that response, it, it didn't mean, that means even if you didn't like the vegetables, the food was beautiful. So you, you would eat the meal, you know? And it was this it, it very phenomenal view that certain human beings have, where regardless of how much messed up, excuse my language, messed up shit happens on this planet, they don't, they realize because you're alive once, you also deserve to see what that be, be, unknown beauty is. <clears throat> So anyways, guys, I'm going to do something unique. I'm going to end the talk, and then I'm going to go uh, set up a Discord link. And anybody interested to join the Discord, um, you're welcome. I'm going to hold the Q&A in the Discord, so technically from the video's point of view, there's not going to be a Q&A. Or let me hold a Q&A. <laughs> okay. Let me say this last thing. Even if there is <coughs> a species in denial of its greatness, which means there's a member of that species that's denying their own greatness, let's say you do. Let's say you deny your greatness and years, eons. Let's say you're an immortal being and you've denied your greatness. You're like, no, I can't do it. That simple statement has come to mind and you've denied your own greatness or how you can envision a greater way of something being. You know, for how long? Imagine eons past, so many years past. Then you'd be like, okay, let me see the other side. And playfulness is a sort of abidance with nature, because you can only be playful if you trust the moment. If you distrust the moment, you it, playfulness, tra the, the same creativity that's in playfulness transitions towards alertness. People don't realize the value of communication. People don't realize that communication is co-creation. 
It is world building sequentially. And everything in life, when you go speak to someone, and sometimes uh, af after I, when I feel when a person observes that they're not a thought, they're not language, they get a sort of incredible awareness to language where they can play with it. They can play with language. What does that mean? That means it's like whatever you do, you can have that, uh, your effort can be of uh, the greatest honor. <clears throat> that means I'm like, all right, nobody can see my eyes. Nobody can see through my eyes except me. That's the view we, the, everybody has. You know, your eyes are your own. But check this out. If your eyes are your own, <coughs> then who can honor you? Only you can honor you. And if you don't honor yourself, that means you haven't accepted nature's first step. I remember I was in the UK giving this talk, and um, I was in this accommodation area during sort of university period uh, I went towards mechanical engineering at the time and I remember I started giving these talks in 2014 and I would at night when there would be nobody I would just go and give the talk because it was like quiet and uh, there would there would be less vocal interruptions and I remember there would be some on some weekday weekends that um, there was once this incredibly intoxicated but very beautiful girl just I was midway giving a talk and I was holding my phone in my hand and just giving this talk and she just jumps into the uh, talk and uh, she's very touchy and whatnot all this <clears throat> and eventually like I, I talked to her and whatnot and she says something which shocks me I mean it totally I just put the talk on pause but she see she says something that shocks me and she said that when she looks in the mirror she doesn't feel she's beautiful and i realize how how unique this life is that the most beautiful people can feel ugly to themselves and what is that ugliness and i think that ugliness is an opportunity cost of the vow the honor the action they've done has has had do you see because every human being just like they need space to move around they also need a certain space of acknowledgement. That means you have to acknowledge them in a certain way so they can feel that they can be someone. This is even so crucial for children. <clears throat> so anyways, guys, uh, let me set up this Discord. The talk is over at this point. And the idea is, like, the same time you're thinking that you're inefficient is the same time you could be thinking you're efficient. You know? It's like same moment, you know? It's like, don't forget, the free will is, is the divine part of life. <laughs> because it took us four billion years to consciously have this ability to, to navigate as attention. We must now utilize this. <clears throat> so anyways, guys, that's the end of the talk. I'll see you in the Discord server. Much blessings, and namaste. Wait for the link. Uh, yeah. Or actually, yeah, Discord server right there. Okay, let's open it up for like five minutes q a in case probably usually nobody has questions because i'm such a good speaker <laughs> let's have five minute q a and in that five minute q a i'm going to set up the discord so anybody who's um that this is the end of the talk part you know thanks for listening all right, let's see, Discord. Who's dared to diss my core? Okay, that's the Discord link, guys.
Oh, it's a, okay, okay, okay. So it's more like whether we're conscious and do anything or not, the, the nature is nature kind of mentality. Mm -hmm. How would you how would you see it if if it was um empty page and we add a pen for a little while like this existence of ours you know <laughs> yeah man. <laughs> Mm-hmm. 
Okay, yeah. The observer. Yeah, yeah. Nice, nice. So it helps with the discrimination of it, right? Between imagination and reality. Like as if you're 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 behind your eyes, you're like in an additional room than just an objective room, you know? Yeah, that's uh <laughs> Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hey man, that's uh, too easy. <laughs> Wow, yeah, yeah. Nice. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah you know it, it, I, I, I kind of resonate with what you're saying in, in the way where it's like you don't suffer it, like you, it, you it's like 
you're not attached to the image of your suffering. You know, that's one thing that I, I when I kind of notice that observer, I'm like, wait a minute, I'm noticing myself. I'm, I'm aware of a self. So how is the awareness, the self, if every day I wake up and the, sub, the, the subjectiveness of the moment shifts, right? And trust me, it's so subtle, man. Like it's like, it's like the person could be sitting somewhere and on a couch, you know? <laughs> Imagine the person sitting on the couch. It's like something's wrong. Something intuitively is wrong with the world. You know, then the person sees they're like sitting on a remote controller or something, you know? Like it was like such a such a small little thing, but it made them kind of suddenly see it as a big thing, you know. Like a lot of suffering is, I feel it could be like just small chess moves you gotta make and they'll go away, you know. Sh small shifts in view. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Man, I'll tell you the I think I think a good resolution towards seeing religion is like like imagine a group of people went to like the louvre and they saw the mona lisa and they started worshiping the mona lisa do you know so so for me it's like it's an it's an artwork that's fascinating for the time it happened it was like unique it was like a strange move at the time right it's an artwork but it doesn't mean that artwork should define like your the political system or your you know your everything you know so so it's i think it's a relationship people have with the story because at the end of the day it's language right P people are doing something with that language that becomes very personal you know yeah yeah you know i kind of see it as like paint believe it or not and then you you use as as much paint as you need to draw the picture and then you at some point stop and look back at the picture you know like it's uh so i don't know something like that
No. Um, I kind of like, the way I, I experienced that was like, I don't know, sometimes before I sleep, like I notice what happens to the attention. And I've had moments where I felt like, um, like I've, I've been in a room and I've, I, my attention has felt like, a, like first I'm in the room and the space is outside, like outside of the body. And then there's been this other feeling where I felt like the room, aware of what's in it, right? So the way it is for me is that it's like, it's not, it's like when I stop look, uh, treating the moment like a thought, then I notice what's there. So every breath becomes like, it's like, it, you know what it is? It's like a stillness and silence where the body's biological activities come into focus. So you're noticing things, you know, like that moment where you're about to sleep, right? So with every breath, it's kind of like a radar scan. Like I kind of scan my body with my breath, you know? Like, oh, okay, you mean it that way? <laughs> sure, yeah. I don't know, maybe maybe Batman meditates like that, you know? <laughs> Just like, you know, he's uh, <laughs> embodying a bat. That's his superpower. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 